So verse 6, we're moving verse by verse through this epistle. And verse 6 begins to get really kind of interesting. It talks about the angelic fall or an angelic fall. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's read Jude chapter 1 verse 6. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So, Remember, I'm sure we've all been to many of these Jude messages already. But remember that Jude is giving illustration after illustration, predominantly illustrations drawn from the Old Testament, not exclusively, but predominantly about how God deals with people who profess to know Him, love Him, serve Him, and yet do not have faith to believe and receive God's gracious gift of salvation. So Jude talks about in the church, there are people who creep in unnoticed, unannounced, and they're there and they will do harm in the long run because these people are not on board with the mission of Christ. They're not people who have had their hearts sanctified by grace. They are there for their own selfish purposes. And Jude wants to list for us reasons why we must be confident that judgment truly comes. There may be a delay, but it is sure and certain. In the first example we saw last week, Jude told us that after Jesus having saved the people out of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So that example that Jude gave was what we might call a like for like example. An example where you have the people coming out of Egypt, they're rescued slaves who've been delivered and through unbelief they die in the wilderness not having obtained the promised land. And Jude's warning to us is don't be like those people. Be people who go on in the strength and the knowledge and the wisdom and grace of God. Don't fall short. Don't fall away. Don't draw back. Don't turn aside people who maintain. So that's like for like. Now, in this next verse, verse 6, Jude is going to up the ante, so to speak, and he's going to speak from the greater to the lesser. He's actually going to talk about the example that the angelic host has for us. So putting it Putting it in summary fashion, if even angels weren't spared and have suffered such great punishment, what will become of humans who are weaker, lesser in glory and majesty, lesser in excellence and intellect? And when humans rebel, they should anticipate a just retribution from God. So the greater example, of course, are angels and the punishment that they receive due details for us shows us that we should anticipate that if that's what God does to such a thing that is greater than us, that is humans, then God will, of course, most assuredly judge humans justly who rebel. So there's two parts to this. Firstly, the angels' sin. What did the angels do? What was the, what was the rebellion of the angels? And the second part is what was their punishment? What did God mete out? What did God serve them as His just Retribution. So let's take a look at the first part. What was these angels' sin? In the words of Jude, they did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. That was their punishment. Their proper dwelling, of course, was heavenly glory. It was a position of authority, of majesty, of perfect life and light. And what we read in the scriptures is that these angels develop a, 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 a wanderlust. They, they, they develop a covetousness to lust after forbidden passions. Jude doesn't go into much detail. In fact, there have been many commentators that have sort of been divided over this. Is, is this referring to the initial angelic rebellion under Lucifer when a third of all of heaven's angels rebelled and turned against God and were cast down to the earth? Or is this something else? There are, there are those of us, I'll admit my position right out of the gate here, there are those of us, like, like me, I believe that this actually refers to the angelic rebellion that's spoken of in Genesis chapter 6. I'm going to argue why I think that in just a moment. At, at the surface, that may not seem compelling, but Jude doesn't even go into any detail. Jude doesn't tell us exactly what this rebellion was specifically, but Jude rightly centers their rebellion on what they chose to squander. I find that really compelling. It would have been easy for Jude to just say, this is what they did. This is why God judged them. This is why God has condemned them and punished them. But Jude wants us to think actually more specifically about what these angels squandered. 
And that's why Jude goes into this specific detail, talking about their proper domain, their position of authority, their proper dwelling. They squandered it. They relinquished it. They, they willingly and happily surrendered it to go after sin and rebellion. And this is always true for sin, isn't it? When we think about, when we think about sin in its essence, what sin is first and foremost, is not so much what you go after. It's not so much the temptation that you allow yourself to salivate over and finally you give in to it and you, you succumb and, and you, you relish it. That's not so much what sin is principally. Sin is what you give up. Sin is what you squander and relinquish and rebel, particularly for those of us that are in Christ. Of course, none of us are naive enough to believe that Christians can't sin. We know Christians do sin. They ought not. Like all people ought not sin. Perhaps more than most people, Christians ought not sin. But when they do, sin is always an abandonment of the promises and the proper dwelling place that God calls us to. And this is, this is curious enough. It's more, about, it's more about what we're tempted away from than what we're tempted toward. Here is the real perniciousness, the real heinousness of all sin, especially for those of us that are, that are in Christ or more broadly those that are in the church but not distinctly in Christ. That's, that's the categorical distinction that Jude is initially assuming. There are people in the church but they're not in Christ. And those people, when they sin, they sin against the light that they have. And so we think about the angelic experience, especially for angels. This is why Jude spends the majority of his words on dealing with their particular rebellion to speak about, it's more about what they gave up. So when we sin, let's think about us who are in Christ, true believers, those who will, of course, be sustained by God's grace through to the end of this race, to glory. When we sin, we know that we surrender and abandon the sweet presence of God's sensed communion. That's true. We know that when we sin, the first thing we feel is an inner subjective distance from God. Now, both of these things, I'm going to offer you two of them, are purely subjective. I know that if we're in the covenant of grace, we can't actually get distant from God because our nearness to God was all and entirely predicated on the merit of Christ. But there is a subjective experience that all of us know a little too well. We sin we don't feel like we and God are on the best of terms. For at least a temporary period of time, we, we sin and we feel like we've lost something of the relish of communion with God. We sin and what do we find the hardest thing to do? To pray, to open a Bible, to, to fellowship. We, we sin and we surrender something of the sweetness of God's felt presence. More than that, and more importantly than that, when we sin, again, this is subjective, but the subjective assurance of our salvation, the subjective assurance of our salvation begins to be diminished. Sin breeds doubt. I can't tell you the amount of people that I've interacted with in a, in a sort of a pastoral context where they've sat down with me and they've said, they've said Craig, I, I'm struggling to feel saved. Now, initially, when someone opens a conversation like that, I want to at least, at least attack that phraseology like it's essential to feel saved. That is, in the Christian life, that's a pure luxury. If you feel saved, God bless you. But there are going to be days when you don't. You're going to wake up feeling like, like all this is a sham and a myth and a legend and can all this be true? And if you're sitting there right now thinking, do even pastors, some have days like that? They do. This is the reality of doubt. Now, when we sin, we introduce more doubt and the power of doubt. And I will have people come and ask me, Craig, why don't I ever feel the assurance of the Spirit? The Scripture promises me that I have a right to it. The Spirit of God bears witness with my spirit that I'm a child of God and an heir and co-heir with Christ. It normally doesn't take too much digging to find out these people that are being mentioned are deeply engrossed in some habitual sin. And normally my response is, you have no right to feel saved. You, you might very well be saved. I'm not saying that Christians and habitual sin can never meet in the middle. I, I'm saying that if that's your life, there's no wonder that doubt feels like the strongest emotion in your life. There's, there's no wonder. When, when we sin against the light we have, what it does is it begins to diminish the light of faith, the courage of faith, the boldness of our faith. And it certainly gives strength to doubt. 
Again, I feel like I need to clarify and add the caveat. Yes, our assurance, the assurance of our salvation ought to be firmly established in the objective of what Christ has done. Firmly established in the objective. So if someone says, Craig, I don't feel saved, my initial response is, look to Christ. Look to Christ. Does he look like a an able savior? Does his work look like a sufficient work of grace to save you? Don't look at your sin and think to yourself, how can I ever be saved? Look at Christ and say, how could I ever be lost? Look at the magnificence and the glory and the omnipotence of this sacrifice. But we all know this by experience, that that all sounds good on paper, right? That that sounds really, really evangelical and gospel saturated. But when we sin, We lose something of the confidence that is ours in the Spirit because sin always breeds more and more doubt, more and more confusion. Sin robs us of peace and our hopeful reflection on the work of Christ. We have to think about coming back to the experience of the angels because that's what Jude wants us to meditate on in verse 6. Even the angels who did not maintain their proper authority or their proper domain but rebelled. Which is this fall? Which sin is this? And I proposed this earlier on by saying there are commentators and and theologians that believe this is referring to the initial satanic fall of angels before Adam's fall in Genesis 3. After creation, before Adam's fall, that is when the the entire Luciferian, if you will, revolt occurred. Or is this referring to some other kind of angelic revolt? This is what Jude tells us. They did not stay in their proper domain, but they rebelled. Is it some, is it the satanic fall? or a subsequent fall. I think the next part of our discussion, at least for me, is compelling enough evidence to believe this is not referring to the satanic fall. This is referring to some subsequent fall. And as I'd already said, if you, if you agree with me on my understanding of Genesis 6, and maybe you don't, we've got a sermon on a YouTube channel about the, the Nephilim and the, the fallen ones, and you can go watch that. It's, a, it's nearly an hour-long sermon where I present my case. Maybe you will or won't find that compelling. But I believe in Genesis 6, the sons of God that are mentioned there are angelic beings who seek after conformity to man's form to intermarry with the daughters of man. It's a horrid, a grotesque, a, a sexually deviant episode. But I'm going to show why... I think that's also what Jude is referring to. Now, if you were, maybe many of you weren't, but those of us that were there when I taught that sermon on the Nephilim, maybe a year and a half ago now, I don't exactly remember. But I I, I tried to demonstrate that one of the compelling evidences for me that in Genesis 6, the, the sons of God should be understood as angelic beings and not, you know, the lineage of Adam or whatever the other explanation is offered is because in the time that the New Testament was being put together, it seems like this is the pervading opinion. The pervading opinion among most Christians of the first century, when you read the extra biblical literature, is they understood that that particular revolt of angels in Genesis 6 related to them desiring to intermarry with women and have offspring thereof. And I think that's why Jude's wording is the way it is. So the second part of this is the punishment. The punishment. The first part was their rebellion. The second part is God's response. This is what we read. God has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Now that's pretty compelling to me. What it doesn't say is God allows these fallen angels to be converted into demons who prowl around around doing Satan's bidding because that was the effect of the Luciferian fall. Remember that those angels that rebelled with Satan previous to Genesis 6 After the creation narrative, those angels that fell were cast to the earth. Those angels we meet with in Scripture as demonic strongholds, demonic forces, demonic personalities. We meet with them in Scripture. But these angels have not been given that fate. In fact, these angels, we are told, they are a special class of angels who were sunk into a pit of gloomy darkness referring to some lightless cavity of the underworld, imprisoned in everlasting chains with nothing to do but await their judgment. I find this compelling. It's a a different, it's a different punishment 
for what I perceive to be a different revolt, a different rebellion. Now, here's the, here's the, the rub of this. If you, don't, if you don't imbibe that particular interpretation that I'm offering, that's okay. Jude's point remains the same, and the application remains the same, but I don't think we can do sufficient justice to the actual punishment that God renders appropriate to this particular revolt if we don't make that distinction between Satan's revolt and the Genesis 6 revolt. But let's leave that aside because that's dubious at best and controversial. What exactly is in, is in, in these angels rebellious? What's their punishment? We're told they're enchained. We're told that they are in a purposeless waiting. So they're in the state of desperate boredom. We are told that they are in a place of emptiness and that there is a, there is a darkness. Now, when we kind of list it like that, it may not quite feel as horrid as it actually is. But as we bear in mind that these angels, once glorious beings, beings entirely possessed with light. In 2 Corinthians, Paul actually describes angels as angels of light. He does that by the negative. You remember Paul says to the Corinthian church that even Satan masquerades or disguises himself as an angel of light. Light. That, that's a phrase he's using to describe those non-rebellious angels who kept their proper abode and maintained serving God. They are angels, beings of light. They are removed from all light. And, and notice this, as, as the wording is in Jude 1.6, the darkness that they are imposed upon them isn't just a lack of light, this insufferable punishment is a gloomy darkness. There's something about this darkness. Don't, don't read this darkness as in there was no lights installed or no candles or matches struck. That's not how you should understand this darkness. This is, this is a gloominess. In fact, in the original Greek, the word gloomy, if you're following with me in the ESV, the original Greek doesn't even have the word gloomy. That's a, that's a word that the translators have brought in to help us understand that the word for darkness here is not the normal word used to mean the absence of light. It means the darkness of the realms of the dead, the darkness of the underworld, the, the, kind of, the kind of distinct, tangible, hopelessness, depressing kind of darkness. These angels went from being beings of light to being entirely caged inside this dense, gloomy, thick darkness. From the highest point, Jude wants us to contrast this, the highest point to the lowest dungeon. I think I was meditating upon this today, trying to find words and phrases to depict this punishment, and it just occurred to me that for any one of us, if we, could, if we could in an instant just get a vision of these incredible beings of light around the throne of God, singing their hymns of praise and worship to the all-glorious divine being who is God, if we could see them in their glorious state and then immediately be given a, a view into this gloomy place of utter darkness where everlasting chains hold their prisoners without mercy. If we could see that contrast almost instantaneously, it would be a thought almost entirely unsustainable by us. An insufferable contrast. To consider just how constraining this darkness is for beings who were once beings of glorious light. It'd be utterly overwhelming. That's what Jude wants to compel us to consider. Remember, this is, a, this is a, from the greater to the lesser analogy. This is what God does in His perfect justice to the most glorious, intelligent, powerful, majestic, created entities that God ever made. If they rebel, there is no mercy. If they turn away, if they surrender their rights to God's throne and relationship to God by pursuing rebellion, this is their end. So how is this an example to us? How is this, what, is, what, what does Jude want this consideration to, to teach us? What are, what are we learning here? Well, I think what Jude, one of the main points he's trying to make is to, is to ask us, what are we trusting in? What are we trusting in? Where is our faith? 
You know, like it's, it's just so common for Christians to use the language, my, my faith is in God, my faith is in Christ, my faith is in the gospel. And sometimes we speak like that and we don't always stop and think about what does this actually mean? What is our faith in? So these angels, they had strength beyond our ability to, to understand. They had power. They had authority. They had purity and perfection. They had glory. They had a lot of peers, people around them that were like them. And we know that when we read scripture, angels tend to band together for communications of peace or declarations of war. We can see that in scripture. So what's your trust in? Because there would be a lot of people that regularly attend, even good gospel proclaiming churches, who have put their trust in something other than the finished work of Christ. Now they may not realize it. They, they may feel like because they call themselves Christians, because they speak like Christians, they, they act and interact like Christians, that certainly they're Christians. But when you, when you press and you probe and you find out their confidence is in their strength, the strength of their theological knowledge or their Bible memorization or their authority. They've been elevated to a position in a church where they actually get to have the say over some things and they get to throw weight around or maybe their power is in their perceived purity. You know, they're not as bad as other Christians that they know. Their life isn't as contaminated with the sin that they see other Christians' lives contaminated with. Maybe their trust is in their glory. Maybe they just feel like, you know, if God's going to end up saving anybody, I feel like he's probably going to save me because after all, I'm worth saving. I've had Christians talk like this. Or maybe they're peers. Maybe, maybe they feel like they're, they're simply running with the right crowd. And when God, when God actually brings his judgment to the world and saves his people, that they're going to be swept up with the crowd and they're going to be on the, on the right side, on the winning side on judgment day. None of those things will bring us any comfort on judgment day if that's where we have located our hope and our trust. None of those things. And the best example to prove that none of those things are ever going to be a a confidence or a peace or a hope for us that lasts beyond the judgment day is angels had those things in spades. And look at what happened to them when they rebelled. Look, look, Look what God decided was the just and worthy punishment For them, because they turned away from him, and because simply in the words of Jude, they did not keep their proper domain. The fall came to these angels on account of choosing rebellion rather than God. We have to be reminded that if we are not found in Christ, it doesn't matter how holy we think we are, it doesn't matter how strong we think we are, it doesn't matter how robust our knowledge is, or good works, or our meritoriousness, or, or religiosity, none of that will ever save. We must be in Christ, seeking lives, living lives of repentance, mortifying sin, and pursuing the glory of Christ. This is a very compelling argument when Jude presents it as a contrast from the greater to the lesser. If angels didn't stand a chance, and they didn't, they were already in that eternal, enchained prison of darkness. Then in the words of Jude 1.6, the angels who did not stay within their own position, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal, j- eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Let's close, if you will, with me with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity we've had this evening of studying this challenging, this this curious verse here in Jude chapter 1, 6, God. We thank you for this ability and privilege to unearth and mine the riches of these wonderful words. Father, these are your words. These are words that have come through the, the power and inspiration of the Holy Spirit preserved throughout all ages, for us to study here tonight and to be, to be challenged by them, to be encouraged and convicted by them, Lord God, as your Spirit ministers to us through these, your words. I pray that we would take this warning to heart, Lord God. I pray that none of us would be found to be among those people that just did church really well, that just did church really often, that just put on the, the right airs and, and put on the proper face and said the right words. But all the while, we were choosing our own way as opposed to yours, Lord God. 
We were choosing self-sovereignty and, and the lordship of ourself over our lives as opposed to Christ. We weren't seeking to mortify sin. We weren't seeking a life of repentance. We were found in the last to be unworthy people. Father, I pray that Jude's message would really hit us deep and hard, that we must be found in Christ. We must know that in and of ourselves dwells no good thing, but in Jesus is all that's ever needed to save a hellbound sinner such as we are. I pray, Lord God, that this, this verse would be a loud, like the shout of an archangel, would be a loud proclamation of the gospel to us here this evening. We ask you by your grace to bear fruit through these words in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>